So thank you very much everyone for being here. We have uh, the pleasure of having Valdis Dombrovsky. Um, Valdis, uh, I've been asked not to do, you know, too formal of intros and just move to the questions right away. Um, uh, but uh, I'll try to, to be honest to that, to be true to that. So Valdis uh, shapes the European Commission economic and trade policy, um, focuses on building future ready economy. Um, you are responsible for chairing the economy group, overseeing major programs like the Recover and Resilience Facility and InvestEU, uh, and coordinating efforts on the Economic and Monetary Union and the European Pillar of Social Rights. You also represent the Commission in key financial councils, enhancing economic governance, reforming the World Trade Organization, promoting sustainable trade partnerships, and ensuring trade agreements reflect environmental and labor standards. And you also, I don't know, I have the list, okay? Okay, of the programs uh, for which you are responsible directly. I don't know how it's possible. Um, you also focus on protecting Europe from unfair trade practices, contributing to the carbon border adjustment mechanism and leading on industrial and semi strategies, underpinning sustainable and inclusive economic strategy of Europe. So I, I'm going to go in the questions now, and then uh, I will ask a couple of intro questions, and then you guys go ahead with questions. We'll, we'll do a QA uh, in a very informal and real way. So. Um, the, the tendency here is the following. I've been in a couple of meetings like that with high level uh, representatives of the EU and the US. In the beginning, there are no questions. And then when we're out of time, minus seven minutes and everyone is yelling at me uh, through phone and already physically, there are 17 questions. So it would be great if we smooth that process a little bit. So if you have a question, don't wait until the end because it's very likely there'll be no time and I'll have to cut off some of the questions, okay? So starting with this, there is of course, uh, one of the key themes uh, for Ukraine is, uh, at the moment, is uh, uh, Ukraine facility program from the EU and financing. Ukraine is facing a budget gap, not a military, just a budget gap between 37 and 40 billion uh, US dollars, depending on uh, the circumstances in particular on the damage Russia inflicts. Uh, the EU is the major contributor and anchor of support uh, this year through the Ukraine uh, facility program. And we're very, very uh, close to the finish and the success of this, uh, um, of getting to the funding. The funding is spread, it's medium term, is spread uh, over several years, it's 50 billion, but it's uh, front-loaded. It's exactly what Ukraine needs. Um, about 18 billion uh, will be this year out of those 50, uh, according to what's publicly known. What the reality will be, sometimes it might be uh, changed. So, but you also have similar programs, um, maybe different, but you have recovery and resilience instruments in, inside the EU, and you're overseeing a portfolio which is 10 times or order of magnitude higher than the Ukraine uh, facility program. So, um, how, how is this facility program for Ukraine different from the standard EU instruments? Are there more uh, additional conditions or different angle? Um, how is it, uh, um, are there some structural reforms or some benchmarks which are non-typical? Or is there something missing that we're getting a, an easy pass because we, the, the circumstance and in other instruments, you will be more demanding? So uh, if, if I might start with this uh, little soft warm-up question. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you for this uh, invitation to uh, SKIV School of Economics. And uh, well, uh, Happy International Women's Day to those who are celebrating it. We had some discussions that views vary on this uh, topic also here. Uh, but let's move to the question on, uh, uh, on uh, Ukraine um, uh, uh, facility. Uh, indeed, so now uh, the decision-making process on Ukraine facility is uh, finalized. So uh, we have uh, 50 billion euros uh, available for uh, Ukraine uh, for those uh, purposes. Uh, and already uh, around uh, middle of March, uh, we will be uh, paying as a first part uh, four and a half uh, billion uh, euros. Um, uh, 
So uh, Ukraine facility consists of um, 33 billion in loans and 17 billion in grants. Uh, and the loans part basically uh, serves a, a macro financial stabilization uh, function. Like for example, last year we had 18 billion euros macro financial assistance plus uh, program for Ukraine, which is basically uh, budget support. So the money goes to, to, to the budget of Ukraine and covers uh, current financing needs. So, uh, and uh, similarly, uh, uh, in Ukraine facility, so part is basically to cover uh, this financing gap, which you was mentioning, and actually, uh, according to uh, IMF estimates, it's even above 40 billion euros, uh, and uh, clearly this Ukraine facility will go uh, uh, a long way to, to cover this financing gap, but uh, the support of other international donors is uh, also very important well first and foremost us uh, financial support we where we hope that uh, uh, also this will be finally done because it then helps to unlock also imf program and other international uh, support um, so on uh, how this uh, ukraine uh, facility is uh, uh, supposed to work so first uh, first of all ukraine has to prepare uh, ukraine uh, uh, recovery plan uh, and I know that your school is also involved in uh, helping the government to uh, to prepare this plan, uh, which uh, then uh, needs to consist of um, uh, investments and uh, structural reforms. Uh, to um, uh, uh, and then the money is disbursed uh, following the fulfillment of those investments or uh, structural reforms. So, uh, and I would say the main policy anchor for Ukraine in in a case it's a, a question of accession to the EU uh, because uh, well that provides a clear uh, framework on what needs to be done and a clear end goal in terms of uh, policy uh, and you mentioned the uh, 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 recovery and resilience facility which is a main part of our uh, next gen uh, EU next generation EU uh, uh, European economic recovery uh, plan which is uh, around uh, uh, 800 billion euros, so indeed more than another of ma magnitude uh, uh, bigger. Uh, and the recovery and resilience facility is a main part of this. And one can say that indeed we uh, kind of took some inspiration from the recovery and resilience uh, facility when thinking uh, uh, about also uh, uh, Ukraine facility. And it's the same idea to, uh, to prepare a comprehensive plan combining investments and structural reforms and then receive uh, funding in line with the implementation of those uh, investments and structural reforms. That's uh, the same what EU member states need to do to get uh, access to recovery and resilience uh, facility funding. They all have prepared their national recovery and resilience plans. And now as they are implementing the plans, they are receiving the money. Uh, so, uh, so the logic is similar. Uh, well, you ask what are the differences? I already mentioned probably the main difference is that uh, in case of Ukraine, there is a strong this macro financial uh, assistance dimension uh, uh, because there is a funding gap to be uh, covered. We do not have this in case of EU member states. So, in, EU, in case of EU member states, it's uh, fully focused on uh, reforms and investments. Thank you very much. I would like to follow up in asking how, in your view, we may balance the relationship or the role in this Ukraine facility. Um, elements, conditionality and reforms of the central and local governments. So because um, decentralization was one of the key uh, pillars that created uh, post-2014 the level of resilience in Ukraine. And also it creates political competition. But the war, the nature of war, is some form of centralization. It's just inevitable because the military is run centrally. Uh, the government, uh, the macro-financial stability is run centrally so the, the, the everything becomes very very tight and so um, in the within the Ukraine facility program uh, how should we think or how do you view what the role of local governments and communities might be and how it should be balanced with the central government uh, yeah and uh, again we have the same uh, dilemma when uh, with uh, our uh, economic uh, recovery and resilience facility so uh, basically, uh, uh, as regards uh, Ukraine uh, facility itself, uh, our uh, counterpart, the counterpart of the EU as a, as a donor, is uh, 
uh, the central government of uh, uh, Ukraine. So we are working with the government, it's its government's plan, we assess the implementation. So, uh, but then of course it's important uh, how government is organizing work with uh, uh, local authorities, but also with uh, various stakeholders, social partners and so on. And uh, we certainly encourage and in a sense uh, uh, push for this uh, engagement because it's uh, important that uh, plan, which is strategic plan uh, of, of major importance that it's, it's discussed with all relevant stakeholders that we know that everyone is in, on, on, on board or at least uh, understand what is going on and, and how it's uh, uh, going on. Uh, another aspect in, in terms of uh, local governments, uh, uh, we know that uh, Ukraine is also trying to promote, besides now Ukraine facility, uh, also uh, a cooperation between various uh, EU countries, uh, regions, uh, cities, uh, kind of partner with uh, uh, regions, uh, counties, uh, cities, towns in Ukraine and uh, uh, support uh, uh, the reconstruction, so to say, local government to local government uh, uh, level. Uh, and I think it's also a, 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 a very useful uh, initiative because there is uh, obviously uh, in each uh, place uh, lots of uh, specifics, uh, uh, specific uh, uh, issues for uh, for a concrete place and uh, sometimes it's other local governments which are best to understand in a sense concerns and, and, and best to help to, to address those concerns. So besides Ukraine facilities there is also this kind of local government initiative which we also think is, is, is a good initiative. Thank you. I will we'll move now for, to the last question on the Ukraine facility. Um, there is a contingency that the gap will be there. So let's say the U.S. funding doesn't come through before the elections or uh, the gap increases because of a major development on the front lines uh, which will affect the economy or something else uh, might happen because uh, Ukraine is in a difficult environment. What are the... What are the feasible options to expand uh, the facility in that case? And in particular, um, the facility makes reference to Russian assets, that if some proceeds are be become available, they will finance the facility. And there are about 200 billion in funds in the EU countries, according to some estimates. And so that's significant amount. So what's what's the thinking in the situation around the Russian assets as a potential source for expanding or financing the facility? Uh, uh, okay, well, uh, indeed, it's uh, clear when we uh, put forward this uh, facility, it was in a sense best estimate we could give, uh, could give at that uh, moment. Uh, and uh, it's a medium term uh, facility 2024 to 2027 and uh, obviously uh, many things uh, can happen and we may have to, uh, to react to the events as they uh, develop. Well, we were able to do it in uh, 2022 uh, when uh, we uh, took many ad hoc decisions to, to provide macro financial assistance. In 2023 we already set up a proper like annual program having a predictability and instability of financing flows. Now we have medium-term program. So uh, clearly uh, we are able to, uh, to react if um, a situation will require so. Uh, coming uh, to the question on uh, Russian assets. So, so the work is uh, ongoing. Uh, so what has been uh, done uh, so far? So at G7 level, uh, there is a decision taken that uh, uh, the frozen Russian assets, uh, here we're talking uh, specifically about central bank assets, uh, will not be returned to Russia uh, until uh, Russia pays reparation to uh, Ukraine for damage it has created. So uh, one thing has been made uh, clear that this money will not easily go back uh, to Russia. Uh, right now, uh, G7 is uh, working, uh, 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 and there are three uh, separate working groups dealing with this topic, uh, on um, uh, legal and other aspects of uh, uh, possibilities of actually uh, confiscated those uh, frozen Russian assets. So that work is right now ongoing. And, and once again, uh, what I heard that you're also to the extent involved and, and, and supporting and advocating for this, uh, uh, for this work stream within uh, G7. Uh, at the EU level, uh, so uh, we uh, have 
uh, now set the mechanism how to use uh, proceeds uh, from uh, those frozen Russian assets because uh, uh, currently they are generating certain income. Uh, so we have provided legal clarity that this income does not belong to Russia. We uh, set the obligation to relevant financial institutions, central securities depositories, to set that money uh, aside on a separate account. And right now we are preparing and pretty soon move forward with a proposal that then this money uh, should be used for uh, Ukraine uh, uh, support. So that, uh, that work is uh, also uh, ongoing. So, uh, uh, but um, I think the baseline is uh, clear that uh, uh, also according to the international law, Russia as an aggressor has an uh, obligation to pay for the damages it has created. Uh, remains to be seen uh, how much and if they will be willing to do it uh, voluntarily. And those uh, 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 confiscated or, or frozen at current stage assets is obviously a, a, a issue and a, a, a one way of addressing it. Thank you. I'll now move to questions uh, on the EU accession for for Ukraine. So, uh, Ukraine can bring to the EU people and economy. Uh, economy has potential. People are you know, up to 40 million people could become a part of the EU. Uh, we can also bring, uh, we think, um, the knowledge of the modern warfare and the hybrid warfare by Russia and other actors. Um, therefore, strengthening security uh, through that knowledge and experience. Um, with Ukraine, we believe uh, the EU would enhance, at least will contrib contribute to geopolitical strengths of the EU, which is extremely prominent, and, but Ukraine will be an addition rather than subtraction in that area. Um, and um, we'll address of some of the labor market integration, um, innovation, actually, logistical uh, um, issues. So, um, but Ukraine is not alone. Moldova, for example, uh, and also with Transnistria, uh, similar, maybe not at that level of the uh, engagement, but Russian troops are in Transnistria, uh, and Moldova uh, is, is aspiring to become at the Georgia, a uh, similar situation uh, with uh, Russian uh, presence uh, in some parts of Georgia. Um, so um, what's, what's your view on how this process can develop? And in particular, what these countries, and of course we're interested in Ukraine, but what all of these countries can bring to the EU? Uh, well, uh, indeed. Uh... Uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, strategically uh, the decisions are uh, taken and uh, uh, Ukraine has been uh, granted candidate country status and uh, uh, the de uh, decision has been uh, taken on uh, launching accession uh, negotiations. So, and uh, all in all, as you already described, uh, indeed this uh, topic of uh, enlargement has gained a new uh, prominence in current uh, geopolitical circumstances with also uh, uh, Moldova and uh, Georgia uh, uh, getting the candidate country status and in case of Moldova also a decision on starting accession uh, negotiations. Um, uh, also I would say there is a bit of a fresh uh, impulse on uh, negotiations concerning Western Balkan countries. Uh, so uh, enlargement is uh, firmly back on the EU uh, agenda. Uh, uh, clearly uh, if you look at this it's, it's going to make uh, the EU uh, stronger and uh, even more uh, a powerful alliance. Uh, uh, obviously, it has also its its own uh, challenges, including about questions on functioning of the EU, how how EU function will with not 27 but um, 30 something uh, members. Uh, one of the questions which comes is a question of principle of unanimity. We're already now we are having. Uh, difficulties in, in uh, taking a number of uh, decisions. Uh, another uh, topic obviously will be a question of future of common ag agricultural policy. So uh, obviously there are many uh, things to discuss. And uh, the correspondingly there are now discussions also on possible changes of the EU treaty. But at the same time what we have made uh, clear from the European uh, Commission side is that we should not now 
uh, wait for this new EU treaty or for us to sort out uh, all our discussions uh, and not to move forward with enlargement. And actually, from European Commission side, we are coming with, you know, uh, kind of a structural analysis sector by sector how uh, enlargement can be done uh, also within the framework of existing uh, treaty. So we should not allow this debates about the new treaty just to hold uh, back uh, this uh, process of uh, enlargement. Uh, at the same time, it also must be said that um, enlargement process is a long and uh, complicated uh, process. It requires adhesion to EU uh, a key or kind of EU's uh, uh, legal uh, framework in uh, all uh, possible uh, sectors. So it's it's quite a major endeavor also for uh, uh, countries which are uh, 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 which which are preparing for this. But from that point of view, one can say that this uh, momentum in Ukraine is uh, clearly uh, there. We uh, see it in terms of. Uh, uh, preparation of documents relevant to uh, granting the candidates' uh, uh, country status and uh, fulfilling the further steps necessary before launching accession negotiations, now meeting the conditions now for uh, uh, concerning this uh, negotiation uh, framework, which European uh, Commission intends to put forward already uh, next uh, week as a proposal. So uh, clearly we see that in case of Ukraine, that's, that's a, a high a priority and government is really acting uh, fast and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and, and making very good progress. Thank you. Um, I want to turn and talk a little bit about the Polish-Ukrainian relations in the process of EU accession. There are some frictions. First of all, there is some peril with some other uh, accession processes about 20 years ago. And at the time you were finance minister in Latvia and you were a part of the accession. So what are the parallels and what are the ways to overcome the frictions? Uh, uh, okay, uh, what, uh, what are the uh, parallels? Well, uh, it must be said that the EU has changed and the world has changed in uh, uh, 20 years since the uh, 2004 wave of, of enlargement. Uh, one uh, parallel I uh, tend to draw, uh, because sometimes you hear maybe now less, but maybe half a year ago and uh, so, there were, uh, quite a few uh, times you could hear, yeah, but uh, uh, to accept the country size of Ukraine, we need to first re re reorganize the EU, only then we can do uh, and then I was drawing this um, parallel, uh, especially with uh, uh, Poland, because uh, Poland, in terms of uh, 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 population, economy, many uh, parameters, is actually uh, comparable uh, with uh, Ukraine. So in 2004, it was possible to uh, accept 10 new members, including Poland. And it, for that one, didn't need to turn, you know, uh, EU upside down. Uh, it should be possible also in case of Ukraine. So uh, that is uh, that is uh, in a sense uh, one uh, one observation. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, things have changed in that point of view. That uh, also the EU treaty has changed. Uh, previous enlargement 2004 uh, wave in any case was done under the Nice Treaty. Now we have. Uh, uh, Lisbon Treaty, uh, EU is present in many more areas than it was uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but um, um, kind of the mechanics of the process uh, of accession have not, uh, not really uh, changed. So uh, I think there is still uh, uh, a lot to learn from uh, new or by now maybe not so new EU member states uh, on their experiences on the EU uh, uh, assessment because the logic how the uh, uh, accession is done uh, is uh, broadly speaking still the same. Thank you. I have you know four more questions in my protocol approved list, but we and it conflicts with the protocol because there is also time. So I'm gonna go to the last question and skip the rest and we'll open the floor. Um, so. Um, the Commission, I think, uh, came this week up with defense strategy. And um, 
what can Ukraine contribute? What can the lessons from Ukraine contribute? How we can be a part of uh, conversation or value creation for this strategy? Uh, well, uh, indeed. So, um, uh, uh, this week, a European uh, Commission put forward the defense uh, strategy, so uh, also a development of uh, uh, defense industry. Uh, and those are new areas for the EU, because uh, the EU initially was uh, conceived as a peace uh, project, not to allow the war on the European continent. Uh, unfortunately, the war on the European continent is a reality again, and uh, so, um, from the EU, it's very clear that we need to invest uh, much more in our uh, defense uh, 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 capabilities and our uh, military industry. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, because, uh, um, uh, uh, this area certainly requires uh, strengthening. Um, so, and uh, in this uh, uh, defense industrial strategy, which we are now uh, uh, developing, uh, we are uh, treating Ukraine in, uh, as an uh, associated uh, state, so uh, uh, already foreseeing integration also of Ukraine uh, military industry within our uh, uh, defense uh, strategy, uh, because uh, indeed we think that it adds uh, strength to both sides in terms of uh, supporting Ukraine, but also using your ca uh, capacities, your experience now with uh, with the current. Uh, 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 warfare uh, uh, also to 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 integrate this this knowledge this experience uh, already in EU uh, defense uh, uh, industry. So there, uh, this uh, uh, this close link with Ukraine is already there within the uh, 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 strategy, and the strategy also clearly uh, recognizes the geographical uh, dimension that uh, especially. Uh, uh, one needs to uh, pay attention to those uh, countries which are at higher risk of uh, uh, conventional uh, military uh, 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 conflict or conventionally military uh, uh, aggression. Well, with this, uh, obviously, uh, understanding uh, uh, countries which uh, border uh, Russia and Belarus. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open the floor and uh, um, Lip. Uh, yes, I can get the mic to Lip. Then introduce yourself. Of course, we know Glib, but not everyone might know. Hi, um, my name is Glib Vashlinsky. I'm um, executive director at the Center for Economic Strategy, Economic Policy Think Tank in Kiev. Uh, I have a question to continue Timofey's question on accession. Uh, there is uh, or there was an expectation that uh, like after Ukraine became a uh, candidate, country uh, that like there could be like some bright future in terms of uh, uh, trade potential investment potential uh, economic development potential because uh, like Ukrainian uh, companies uh, Ukrainian producers uh, Ukraine generally could become a significant uh, part in uh, in the Europe wide value chains uh, now we see that uh, Situation is becoming very different. Like Poland, in fact, closed the border. Like if no agricultural, if not agricultural producers and uh, transportation companies uh, are closing the border. Uh, however, like uh, it, and there are a lot of uh, like a lot of activities like trying to uh, not to. Um, allow Ukrainian agricultural products that even in time of war, in times of war, without uh, any subsidies are more competitive than uh, EU-made products, agricultural products. What is your vision like within your trade portfolio and this future economy portfolio? What is your vision like how to resolve this issue in a longer term? Uh, how to negotiate it in a way that uh, uh, EU member states will work together in accommodation Ukraine as uh, as the part of value chains that in, in fact could increase competitiveness of the EU products, uh, not uh, a win-lose situation? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, indeed, uh, while uh, we are now uh, starting this process of Ukraine uh, accession uh, uh, to the EU and starting accession negotiations, uh, in parallel, uh, we have uh, developed uh, 
action plan on Ukraine's uh, integration in a single market. So there are a number of sectoral things which can be done already uh, now, uh, which concerns uh, both uh, uh, industry, which uh, we are now uh, negotiating so-called ACA agreement uh, 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 with uh, uh, different uh, sector, uh, sectoral cooperation, uh, ICT, financial sector, um, uh, logistics, so on and so forth. Uh, including this uh, program of Ukraine uh, joining uh, Rome like home, uh, preparing this uh, uh, potentially single European payment area and, and so on and so forth. So there are, there are many uh, sector initiatives already uh, to integrate uh, Ukraine uh, in a single market. Uh, on uh, agricultural sector, well, obviously that will require some uh, more uh, thinking and more uh, reflection because what we see uh, right now obviously is, is uh, quite uh, disruptive. Well, nevertheless, we are moving now forward with a, a prolongation of autonomous uh, trade measures or our trade liberalization measures for Ukraine for another year from June uh, till June 2025. And uh, just uh, yesterday, it was uh, voted by International uh, uh, Trade Committee in the European uh, Parliament. So now it will move to the plenary vote. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll be so uh, finalizing this legislative process uh, uh, soon. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, we uh, see uh, indeed uh, farmers' uh, protests and uh, uh, farmers' protests uh, in uh, different... Um, uh, uh, different EU uh, countries, not only in Poland, uh, and a focus on what the farmers are protesting against varies. Uh, in in uh, Ukraine, uh, sorry, in Poland, they uh, protest against Ukrainian uh, grain, which frankly uh, puzzles me a bit because Polish government already has unilaterally banned Ukrainian grain uh, in, in its market. So the question what, what the really protests are then uh, about. But nevertheless, in, in Latvia, farmers are protesting against Russian grain. Uh, in Germany, they are protesting maybe with a focus on bureaucracy and the requirements of European Green Deal. Uh, in, in France, they are protesting against uh, trade agreements, including, for example, EU Mercosur trade agreements. So those focal points vary, but we see that actually there's quite a lot of uh, a dissatisfaction uh, uh, within farmers' community, and we need to address it. So. We uh, recently launched a strategic discussion with uh, farmers uh, on the future of agriculture uh, in the EU. So, uh, and I think uh, also debates uh, uh, which uh, concerns also uh, specifically the model of common agricultural uh, policy, how Ukraine will fit in this. Uh, will be a part of those broader discussions because this phenomena currently it's not uh, not limited to Poland. Thank you, um, Alexander, then Marta, and then you. And I think that will be, uh, and Athena, and that I think will be it. And we actually uh, will be short on time. Alexandra Batli, Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consultant. Um, first, uh, welcome to Kiev, and thank you for the support that you always provide to Ukraine. On the question, I have a question about Ukraine facility. Uh, Timofey mentioned that we hope to receive 18 billion, but as far as I know, I mean, like in public documents, there is no information yet on the how much we will receive this year. Probably you have more information and you can say it. And another question I have is about the uh, second pillar. Uh, are they already understanding how much we can also receive this year and whether this will be primarily guarantees for investments or this will be real investments to our business? Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, on uh, this uh, annual uh, distribution, I also cannot now uh, jump uh, the queue and do some kind of uh, pronouncements when we'll have announcements, we'll, uh, we will do them. Uh, 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 another important question you raised, indeed, is a uh, question also of uh, uh, private investment in uh, Ukraine economy, and uh, there are uh, initiatives uh, uh, which uh, which are there, including on uh, provision of uh, war insurance, uh, certain projects in EBRD, and uh, and we we continue to work on this uh, topic because that's important, especially for attracting uh, foreign investment. 
uh, also international European financial institutions are working with local ba banks on the questions of provision of credits to Ukrainian companies and especially SMEs because, well, access to finance, cost of finance is uh, obviously an uh, issue. Uh, 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 they are uh, uh, in a context of uh, uh, Ukraine uh, facility, Ukraine plan. Uh, they are uh, uh, elements uh, uh, relating to uh, to business environment, which is also uh, uh, important uh, uh, for uh, for being uh, conducive for uh, investment. So, uh, uh, but uh, this is certainly uh, important uh, uh, work streams that not only we see how we can uh, publicly uh, support, but what are the factors to unlock. Uh, the, uh, uh, the private investment. And there we are also drawing experience, for example, for our uh, InvestEU program, which you mentioned at the beginning, where we are doing things like uh, first uh, certain risk guarantee, first loss absorption capacity, things like this, uh, which are allowing with a limited amount of uh, public funding to un unlock substantially larger amounts of uh, uh, private investment. So we're also looking on these kind of uh, financial instruments. Thank you. Um, please raise hands who have questions. So, um, wow, too many. So let's start with Marta. I'm going to take this round of questions and we're out of time, actually. The protocol tells me. So I'll take all the questions and then you answer what you can. Okay. Uh, Marta, yeah. try to uh, limit your questions to one sentence. Please. My name is Marta, Please. I'm a KC student, and thank you so much for coming today. I have a question regarding the uh, Ukraine facility plan. Uh, so how would your commission um, monitor the costs being uh, distributed and spent uh, within the Ukraine facility, and like, what are the uh, monitoring mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a question. You, you had a question. Just, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Ivan Nagorniak. I am advisor to the Center of Economic Recovery. My question is about the macro financial stabilization of Ukraine. So, uh, according to the basic scenario, um, the war will be ongoing to the till the end of 2024. Uh, what are the maybe mechanisms internal of the Ukraine facility to change this uh, maybe the situation and to help more Ukraine if? If this scenario will be different, I will say so. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, I'll take one more question, Athena, please. This, and I'm, uh, my apologies, yes. Uh, if you write to me later questions, I'll promise to forward them and maybe we'll get an answer. Maybe not, but yes, yeah. Uh, my name is Anna Pavlenko, the new, uh, the new voice media. I have two questions, but they are both very short. Um, uh, the That's first... cheating. <laughs> One sentence, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first one, does the uh, EU has uh, any plans on uh, stopping uh, Russian and Belarusian agricultural pro products export uh, to the EU? And the second one uh, is, uh, uh, please share some um, news concerning the EU's uh, 20 billion uh, euro uh, military aid to Ukraine. Yes, thank you. This, uh, uh, yeah. Whatever you can, and my apologies to everyone else. <clears throat> that always happens. Yeah, well, uh, first uh, question on uh, uh, on uh, audit and control. Well, uh, it's uh, clear that uh, this uh, Ukraine uh, facility comes also with uh, uh, strict requirements as regards audit and control. So we expect uh, Ukrainian uh, authorities to set in place the right audit and control uh, system within the country. But then it's also going to be uh, uh, controlled and audited by the European institutions as uh, other EU uh, budgetary uh, programs. And, and believe me, this is actually quite... Uh, uh, quite throughout and quite far-reaching uh, re requirements. So from that point of view, one can expect that uh, uh, this uh, system will be um, uh, uh, functioning. Uh, so uh, on. Um, so now I started to forget the questions. Sorry. The what scenarios, is, if the war is takes... Uh, yeah, further. well, on this uh, macro-financial uh, uh, support, uh, we were discussing it before. Uh, well, uh, uh, currently, uh, that's actually the baseline of uh, uh, um, uh, also Ukraine uh, 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 government for a budget for everything that they plan the full year of war uh, 2024. And correspondingly, also, that's how Ukraine uh, facility is planned. Uh, then on the coming years, of course, we'll have to, uh, have to see, as I was saying before, 
uh, certainly uh, we will be able to react to the circumstances if circumstances will uh, require. So we're uh, able to do it since the beginning of the war. We had very uh, clearly uh, committed to uh, support uh, uh, Ukraine until its uh, victory for, for forever, uh, for, for, for what, uh, what, uh, uh, whatever it takes. So, uh, and uh, we will uh, live up to this uh, 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 commitment. Um, uh, so um, uh, now uh, the Russian uh, right that was about uh, yeah, yeah on uh, on uh, on this question indeed uh, we are uh, currently uh, working on this indeed there are initiatives of some uh, 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 EU member states starting with Latvia but now also Poland uh, uh, some others which are uh, actually initiating this uh, uh, question of. Uh, 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 Russian and Belarusian uh, grain and possibly other uh, foodstuffs in the EU uh, market. So uh, that's uh, uh, something which we are now uh, working. Uh, what are the best ways to uh, uh, to address it? Thank you very much. I think we're out of time. We have to take immediately one picture. No time for picture. Yes, everyone come here for the picture and we'll go in front of this.